As a chef, I know it's not what you spend on ingredients, but results on the plate that count. Using cheap cuts and leftovers and working them hard in the kitchen gives you food in a budget that tastes a million bucks. And I'm going to show you how. First up, my flavor-packed lamb with fried bread. Whether I'm cooking high-end dishes or rustic dishes, trust me, it all has to be impressive. So this lamb dish proves that you don't have to spend a fortune to create delicious food. First off, put the pan on. This is a lamb steak, and it's cut just above the leg, just here, because you can see that delicious bone running through the center. And that's full of marrow, so that just gives the lamb a nice added sweet flavor. Just take your knife, cut through each end. This stops the lamb steak from buckling, so therefore it cooks evenly and colors beautifully. Salt and pepper. Lamb needs quite a lot of help with the pepper, so be quite generous with the pepper. And just pat that down. The pan's just starting to smoke on the outside. Now put the oil in. Get that pan really nice and hot, because this is a cheap cut, so I'm depending on the color of the lamb steak to really sort of impart a lot of flavor. That's the noise you want to hear. If you can't hear that noise, don't drop the steak in. Put a little bit of garlic in there. Not chopped garlic, just whole cloves of garlic, lightly crushed. Don't even waste time peeling them in. Tongs, lift up. That bit of fat around the back, that's on the top of the leg. Tilt the pan and let all that fat render. Rendering is a chef's term. That means melting the fat. It works brilliantly when you're cooking a ribeye as well. Turn it over. Look at that colour there. Beautiful. Now it looks like an expensive cut, and we've got that nice, even sear all over. As it's cooking, just tilt the pan and bake. And basting the lamb steak just means you're sort of adding all that nice, scented garlic olive oil back into the lamb. Beautiful. Now take the lamb out and let the lamb rest. Beautiful. Now, for the perfect rustic crouton. So this bread's quite firm, a couple of days old. Just slice it straight down the center. Dice it up, put it into a bowl. Season it beautifully. From there, I'm going to add some milk. Sounds strange adding milk to a crouton, but it just gives it that nice, rich, creamy texture. And just let that milk sort of absorb into the bread. While that's soaking, I'm going to make the dressing. Go back to that initial garlic that was in the pan. Look at that. Beautiful. Into the pest and mortar. Anchovies. Anchovies go brilliantly well with lamb. I want that nice, salty, vinegary flavor and a bit of kick. Some capers, the little baby cats, very sweet. Now, just pound that to a nice paste. That smells incredible. Next, some Dijon mustard. A nice teaspoon and a half in. A little bit of red wine vinegar, two tablespoons, and then our extra virgin olive oil. Now, got that heat in there, got that nice roasted garlic, a real hearty, chunky vinaigrette that sort of seeps into that lamb. Some fresh parsley. Crunch up the parsley. Delicious flavour. Parsley in. Nice. Now, get your pan hot for the croutons. Olive oil in the pan. Grab the croutons and squeeze all that excess milk out. Not too hard. I don't want them dry. And in. And then just fry them. And the milk inside these croutons give it a nice, spongy, creamy, delicious flavor. That's the color I want. Nice. Now, take them out and lightly drain them. A little bit of kitchen roll onto the board, out. Plate them. Just take this amazing vinaigrette and spread it. Get those croutons. Listen to them, like little boulders hitting the plate. The lamb, sit that on. Next one, on. The rest of the croutons, on. I use all those little bits, and my chef in Paris would kill me right now if you saw me using those, because 
They're the ugly scraps that customers should never see, but, but they're the best bits. Croutons on, and then just drop that sauce on all those little bits of the lamb. And there, uh, that is a perfect way of taking a cheap cut into the Premier League of dishes. Vegetables are such an asset in the kitchen. Healthy, fantastically fresh, and incredibly versatile. And pound for pound, they're so much cheaper than fish or meat. Just make sure you give them plenty of attitude. My homemade gnocchi. Making your own gnocchi is so simple to do, yet the results are absolutely stunning. And it's a great way of using up leftover baked potatoes. You can make gnocchi just with flour and eggs. However, the potato gives it that nice, light, sort of creamy, fluffy texture. Just cut them in half, take your spoon, and scoop the inside of those potatoes. I'm using leftover baked potatoes, but this really works as well with leftover boiled potatoes. Two choices. You can get a fork and sort of mash the potato and get it nice and light and fluffy, or this little gadget. It's called a ricer. I suppose it's a posh word for a potato masher. Just squeeze gently. You can see how nice and light it is. Almost like fluffy little strands of potato. You can do this when the potatoes are hot. It'll go through the ricer so much quicker. Just slice that off there. Now, a nice spoon of ricotta in. A little touch of salt and pepper. It's really important to season the mixture as we go along, otherwise the gnocchi becomes really bland. Flour over the ricotta. Sieved, so there's no lumps. One delicious egg. Give that a little whisk. Now, make a little well in the centre. You want a nice, soft, pliable ball of dough. Give that a really good mix. Get some thyme flowers in there. And this thyme is light, fragrant, and it's just a really nice herb. And with the ricotta, it tastes brilliant. Take the little tips of the thyme flowers. Next, flour your hands generously and knead the mixture into a dough. Fold in and push. And basically what it's doing is getting it nice and smooth. As it starts to get a little bit wet, then just add a little touch of flour. But we want something really nice and soft. Now, don't overwork it. It stops the gnocchi from expanding when it hits the pan. That's exactly what I want, a nice sort of soft fragrant ball. Cut the ball in half, lightly flour the hands and just roll it gently. And just think of a, a big, long cigar. The mixture will start getting a little bit sort of wetter, but do not add lots of flour. Now, lightly flour the knife so when you slice the gnocchi, it doesn't stick. Cut the dough into bite-sized pieces. Just take your finger, dip it in the flour and push down. Why? I want my gnocchi to look like a pillow. And for me, the most important part there is that not one of them are identically the same shape. Water on. Bring it up to the boil. A little touch of olive oil in there. Lightly flour your hand. Lift up the gnocchi. In to the rolling boiling water. Turn that pan to stop them from sticking at the bottom. And let them simmer. And they start to sort of tell you they're cooked when they start floating. Get a pan on, get that nice and hot. Now they're just starting to come up to the top, and you can continue cooking them like that. I like blanching them in the water, taking them out, and then frying them. To study the gnocchi, heat olive oil in a frying pan. Gently lift up and look. They've doubled in size. Drain it, get rid of the excess water, and straight in to the hot pan. Mm. This is where they start to take on a completely different texture. Nice, crisp, sautéed texture on the outside. Gnocchi loves fresh pepper. So, pepper in. And you'll see, as I start turning them, I've got this really nice little sort of brown colour. And they're almost puffing up now, like little parcels. So I want them nice and sautéed, both sides, but light and creamy in the centre. Fresh garden peas in. And the butter gives it that really nice sort of Benoisette flavour on the end. Beautiful. Put a little bit of fresh thyme over the peas 
And then finally, I want to lift it up. Fresh lemon. Zest the lemon over. So, smells incredible. And then finally, seal the deal with a touch of grated Parmesan cheese. Give your veg some attitude, and you'll get amazingly elegant dishes on a budget that are always guaranteed to impress. What more do you want from great cooking? Cheap to make, easy to cook, and absolutely stunning. My next recipe is a proper British classic that's super simple to cook and costs next to nothing, a delicious apple crumble. Crumbles are the perfect way to use fruit when it's in season. There's lots of it about, it's nice and cheap, but most importantly, the fruit's at its absolute best. First off, I'm going to make a really nice light caramel. Pan on, nice and low. Great two apples. And this helps to almost sort of pure the apple so much quicker. And there's a lot of flavour in the skin, so don't worry about peeling the fruit. Whether it's pears, plums, peaches, the flavour's in the skin. Nice. To start the caramel, a couple of tablespoons of sugar. The sugar helps to get rid of the tartness in the apple. A touch of cinnamon. That starts to make it a little spicy. Open up your vanilla and just scrape out all those seeds. Now, this just makes it light and fragrant. All those seeds in to the sugar. When making caramel, be patient and always swirl the dish instead of stirring it. When the sugar goes brown, add the apple. Mm. That starts to sort of cool down the caramel, but it gives it a really nice sort of caramelized puree. Apple's almost disintegrating. It smells incredible. Turn the gas down. Slice up two apples. It's a crumble that's got no frills. Straightforward. No faffing around. No peeling of the skin. I want them to sort of stand out from the caramel. Apples in. Now those nice thick chunks of apple are sort of almost bedding itself into the puree. Dried cranberries gives it that nice sort of shock in the texture. Sweet and chewy. I want it to sort of taste zesty, spicy, so sit the lemon zest on top of your apples and cranberry. Fresh lemon juice over. And that just gives that extra acidic kick. Takes the cranberries, the apples, the caramel, and the cinnamon to another level. Turn the gas off. Just let that sit. And let's concentrate on the crumble. Flour in. A couple of tablespoons of demerara sugar. Sugar helps to get the topping nice and crispy. Butter in. Give that a nice little sort of rub. What we're looking for is like a, a breadcrumb mixture. Lightly season it with a touch of cinnamon. And the demerara sugar sort of helps to get a nice fine crumble mix. And it stops the butter from sort of melting in that flour. So that's the basic crumble mix. But I'm not finished yet. Muesli. Two thirds crumble, one third muesli. Mix that in. If you haven't got muesli, then crunchy granola works brilliantly too. Lovely. Now, start off in the center and work your way around. I want the crispiness on the top, the puree on the bottom with the caramel, and then the texture in the center. A good tip, turn the gas back on. I want it bubbling before it goes in the oven, because then you've just got to cook the top. So as soon as you see that caramel starting to bubble down the side, in she goes. Let's go. Bake at 200 degrees Celsius for 12 to 14 minutes until golden brown. Smells amazing. <sighs> Beautiful. Still bubbling. And look at it. A delicious but very simple crumble with apples at their absolute best. Beautiful.